Intro videos are super awkward. Like, I don't know what to do while that's happening. Like, should be like an interpretive dance to it or so. I don't know what it is. So we're, this is the last week uh, of a series that we've been doing, uh, teaching about people that we consider ordinary in the Bible. Of course, what we discover along the way is that an ordinary follower of Jesus is truly extraordinary. Uh, I'm wondering, I know we have a lot of realtors here, so maybe you guys could give me some feedback, or maybe just uh, the rest of you could could participate a little. Uh, there are not many people actually from Spring Hill, right? There are not many actual natives born and raised. Do we have any? We had one in the last service. Anybody, you'd say, no, I'm, I've always been here. This is home. There's one. Wow, you should get a trophy. This should be a prize or something. That's, thank you for putting up with the rest of us. Yeah, we're so sorry that we came and ruined your city, really. We, <laughs> It's a jumbled mess of people from all over the place, right? So I'm wondering, uh, I know we've got, there are a lot of folks from Michigan, any Michiganders around in Michigan? Yeah, a lot of folks there. Florida and Texas are big ones as well. Florida, Floridians, Texans. Okay, I'm a Texan, all right? A few of us, you know us. We're arrogant and we swagger a little bit, right? That's us, right? A lot of folks from California, a lot of California folks. There's some. All right, did I miss anybody? Are you from Wisconsin? Kentucky. Well, that's practically our backyard. That's not that. <laughs> Illinois. Is there Illinois over here? Oh, wow. A lot of Illinois folks. That's fantastic. Obviously, Andy and his family, Indian. Ohio. Yeah. Ohio. Alabama. Wow. You know what? We bring the banjo out every once in a while just for you. Just for you. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so, you know, and so you may, those of you who came here from somewhere else, you may have been shocked by some things that are completely ordinary here. Because they're not ordinary where you come from, like maybe y'all was a new thing for you, right? Uh, or how about that people in Spring Hill like to put S's on words where S's do not exist. Walmarts is not a thing. It's not on the sign. But they do it. They don't do it to Target. I don't know why they don't go to Targets. They go to Walmarts, though. It's very strange, very weird. Uh, very, very weird. People love their Waffle House here as well. I was, you know, all the things we could have put on Main Street. Waffle House, and it's booming. There are always people there. Um, that one didn't go over very well. Apparently, you guys like Waffle House. Um, but there are all sorts of things. Like, I remember the first Sunday, Becky and I moved here from Texas and way back in 1997. The first church we visited, we were there on a Sunday morning, and the pastor at the end of his sermon uh, said, oh, I'm going to close, and I'm going to pray. And when I'm through praying, then Donna Summer is going to come and, and sing uh, while we pass the offering. And I elbowed Becky and said, I'd like to go through life with the name Donna Summer, like especially if you're a singer, like high expectations. And so we prayed and we said amen. I opened my eyes and there she was. The, <laughs> the queen of disco sang for the offertory while they passed the offering plate. And we've run into celebrities, you guys probably have, right? I was shopping for jeans one day and this guy in a baseball cap comes up behind me and goes, I don't know if I'm cool enough to shop in this store. You think us old guys can do this? And I turn around, it's Garth Brooks, Garth Brooks. I didn't buy jeans that day. I just followed Garth Brooks for long. I was, it was unamazing. <laughs> So, you know, there are things that we think are totally ordinary as Spring Hillians, right, that are very extraordinary and a little weird if you're not from these parts. And we're going to meet a woman this morning, Mary the Magdalene, who is an ordinary Christian, an ordinary Jewish convert to Christianity, an ordinary follower of Jesus, but she's also pretty extraordinary to people on the outside, we're going to be in Luke chapter 8 for most of the morning, and you can turn there in your Bibles. That's on page 705 in these Bibles. Please take one of these Bibles with you. Spend time in it every day. The words in here are better for you than any words you're going to hear me speak this morning. So take this with you. This is a gift to you. So we're going to be on page 705 in Luke chapter 8. We're going to look at four ways that Mary was just an ordinary Christian woman, but how being an ordinary Christian woman is pretty extraordinary. Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, it says this, 
after this, and that after this is referring to Jesus just performing a bunch of miracles, healing people. It says, after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And the 12 were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, and Joanna, the wife of, I can't say that word, and the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Now, Mary, her last name is not Magdalene or Magdala. She's from a town called Magdala. It's a little fishing village, not so little really, on the Sea of Galilee, and it was a pretty wealthy place. Um, and so we have Mary here, and she's introduced as a woman who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Now, as weird as that might sound to you, because we haven't cast out demons in any of our church services recently, that was an ordinary thing. It was an ordinary thing to be freed by God from sickness, from mental illness, from all kinds of heartache and brokenness, and from even evil spirits. This was not out of the ordinary in fact, I looked, I want to see how ordinary is this. I found almost, I think it was 23, 24 instances of demons being cast out of people. It's very ordinary. You might not want to go to a church where that's ordinary, but that was ordinary in those days. There are so many demons. There, I'll give you just three examples. There were, the man showed up at church one day filled with demons. Even religious people could be under evil influence, and so the, Jesus cast the demons out of him. There was a, more of a, a backslidden Jewish guy, a guy who was living with where the pigs were farmed, and good Jewish boys weren't supposed to hang out with pigs, and so Jesus crosses over the Sea of Galilee, and he casts demons out of him, so you can be religious, and you can be kind of, well, I say I'm religious, but I don't really practice it, and you can both be eaten up with demons, and Jesus can take care of you. And then there was a man who was blind, mute, and he had demons cast out of him, and that was super important. That was a very hard case. The only way you could cast out a demon is that a rabbi would ask the demon its name, and then the person would say the demon's name. And once you had the name, you had power over the demon. You could tell that demon to get out of the person. You had to have the name. And so the person had to be able to, to, to talk. So the only person who could cast a demon out of someone who was mute was the Messiah, it was one of the big signs that he was the Messiah, that Jesus didn't need the man to tell him the demon's name because God knows the demon's name. And Jesus cast the demon out of that man. That was a hard case. But I tell you, the hardest case of demon possession that Jesus came up against wasn't the religious person in the church. It wasn't the backslidden religious person hanging out with the pigs. And it wasn't the man who couldn't speak, but it was Mary. How many demons did Mary have in her? What's it say? Seven. Now, in, in Hebrew, numbers have significance. They don't just tell us the quantity, but they tell us the, quanti the quality. And seven gives you the quality of completeness, of fullness. Now, if Mary was a southerner, we would say that Mary was full up with evil. She was full up with demons. I mean, it was, a, it was a complete demonic possession. We don't know what that looks like or what that did to her, but it was, she was considered impossible to cure, a lost cause. Any of you have some of those in your life. The person you've been praying for for weeks, months, years, and you wonder, is it ever going to happen? Are they ever going to come to faith or come back to faith? It seems like a lost cause. Or the heartache and the brokenness in your own life is so complete, it's totally ruined. There's no way anyone could put this back together again. I've got good news for you this morning. No one is so lost that they can't be found by Jesus. Nothing is so broken that he can't put it back together. Nothing is impossible for our God. In fact, this is why Jesus came. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Not just the ones that are easy to take down, not just repair the stuff that would be simple to put back together, but Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. There is nothing impossible for Jesus. In Colossians 1, I love the description of you and I being saved by Jesus. It says that God has rescued us us from the power or the rule of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves and in him we have redemption and forgiveness of sins there is nothing that can't be forgiven nothing that can't be mended no one so lost they can't be found no one so destroyed that they cannot be saved that's good news 
ordinary Christians, every one of us, though you may have never been possessed by a demon, you have been possessed by sin and shame and separation. But you have been set free. Ordinary Christians are freed, and this freedom is extraordinary. It's so extraordinary, I don't want another moment to go by without us pausing to thank God for making us free. And so we're gonna have communion together right now. And I'm gonna pray for us, and I'm gonna ask the ushers to come forward with the bread and with the cup and eat that bread and give thanks to God who gave his own son to set you free. Drink that juice and remember the blood spilled out for you to set you free. How extraordinary that freedom is. God, we thank you for freedom, that we were possessed by sin and shame, that we were prisoners to separation, but through Christ, you have destroyed the work of the devil. God, if there's anyone here this morning who is still under the rule of darkness, still hanging on to shame, still hanging on to sin, God, would you woo them, would you draw them to you this morning? May they make you their king and taste freedom that only you can give. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ushers. So Mary, the Magdalene, was an ordinary freed woman, set free by Christ from sin and shame and death and separation and from seven demons. <laughs> she was also an ordinary wealthy woman, an ordinary wealthy woman who followed Jesus. Look with me again in Luke chapter 8. The very last sentence says that these women, and among them was Mary, these women were helping to support them, support the ministry of Jesus out of their own means. Now, it was not uncommon. It was completely ordinary that Jewish women would support rabbis. Now a rabbi was just a teacher and they would have students and they would often stay in one place and teach but sometimes they would travel around and when they did that a rabbi wasn't allowed to take a salary okay because they they looked at rabbis also as judges like you would go to them if you had a dispute with your neighbor and go rabbi what does the bible tell me how should I handle this and the rabbi would say here's my verdict and so you don't want to be paying someone who acts as a judge because then you're bribing the judge they're not going to be impartial you follow so you couldn't pay a rabbi you couldn't they couldn't be on a salary and so they would have to have a trade making sandals or making tents or doing some carpentry on the side but when you travel you can't take your business with you so what do you do well when you travel you rely on mostly women to help pay uh, pay. The woman couldn't bring a case to a rabbi. That was a very rare thing, so it kind of seemed like, well, she could help you fund, and there's no impropriety going on there. You with me? Okay, so these women would help uh, fund the ministry, and they would often be called matrons uh, of charity or matrons of justice. It was just a, it was a very honorable thing that they did. So that was completely, completely ordinary that they would do that. Now, these women, they were, they were traveling around uh, with Jesus, and that was pretty extraordinary. And while their generosity was pretty ordinary among Jews, to Romans, to the people, the outsiders, they would have looked at it as very bizarre, as extremely extraordinary. So let me give you an example. We have a debate that happened between a Christian philosopher and a Roman philosopher in the second century. I won't bore you with all the details, but it's a very long letter. It's, it's recorded what they each said to one another. And so at one point, the, uh, the Roman philosopher who was not a follower of Jesus said this. Take a look at your gatherings. He said this to the Christian. What are they made out of? Well, mostly women, gullible children. The majority are from the working class. Is not well educated. Mostly poor, even slaves. It makes me laugh when I think how poor you are, barely enough to live on. If this God of yours is so great and so loving, then why are so many of you poor? Either he's not that loving and doesn't care that you are poor, or he's not that great and is unable to do anything about it. Some God you've got. No wonder you're all regarded as fools. Now, what was the Christian's response to that? Well, the Christian said this. Many of our number, okay, most of our number are poor. But what is more important is how we regard ourselves. We consider ourselves to be rich. We have that which is most valuable, the most precious gift, which cannot be lost. And there are those among us who are wealthy. We don't despise wealth. We welcome it when it comes lawfully, but we do not lust after it. And when we get more wealth, we simply give more away. Wealth can be a great burden. 
It weighs you down with many cares and concerns. Traveling light has its advantages, some big advantages. So don't pity us. We have plenty, not only for ourselves, but also for those in need. For a Jewish woman who had wealth, it wouldn't be extraordinary at all to give that to support the teaching ministry of a rabbi. But to the Romans, that was a very peculiar thing. They didn't understand that our rabbi, Jesus, taught us this in Matthew 6. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves can break in and steal it, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven in the work of God where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This week I was reading an article, I don't remember how I came across it, and it was talking about this politician, he had this very big, bold plan, and the journalist said, well, how are you going to pay for it? That sounds very expensive. And so the politician said, and I've never heard this phrase before, it's kind of neat, he said, you know, budgets are moral documents. I'm not even sure there really is a lot of morality in politics these days, but let's just take us to our own personal lives. Like we could say that, look, our own budgets are moral documents. And the way he was saying was like, look, whatever it is that you really love, you will budget for it. Whatever you think is good, you'll find a place for it in your budget. And that's true for an ordinary Christian. Jesus said, wherever your heart is, whatever you really love, whatever is really important to you, it's going to show up in your finances. There's going to be space for it in your budget. Now, to the rest of the world, that is extraordinary. But for a Christian, that should be completely ordinary thinking and ordinary living. Ordinary Christians are generous. But in this day and age, that kind of generosity is truly extraordinary. I want us to be extraordinary, ordinary Christians right now. And we're going to collect an offering. And this is your opportunity to do what your rabbi Jesus taught us to do and to vest in kingdom work so that other people can know him. If it's something that you really love, there will be room in your budget to do it. God, we thank you for giving us time, talent, energy, wisdom, skills, and some wealth that we can share. And we thank you, God, for a trustworthy place where we can share that. We ask for wisdom for our church staff, elders, and finance team that you would guide them as they invest what we give for the greatest good. May it be an investment in the things of heaven and not the things of earth. And God, bring about through our generosity transformation to people's souls. No one can steal that treasure away. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ushers. And while they're collecting this offering, I'm going to keep teaching, all right? So if we can pass and think at the same time, then hopefully we can pull that off, all right? So Mary and all Christians were, are ordinary freed people, ordinary generous people when they have wealth to give. And Mary also was an ordinary discipled woman, discipled woman. Now, disciple is not a title. It's not a position. A disciple simply means student. It's not even a Bible word. It's used outside the Bible a lot. People who studied under Plato or Aristotle or, or whatever they would study. Or if you're learning a trade from your mom or your dad, you're a disciple. It's a very common word. So it's a disciple. And Jesus had Mary as a disciple. Now sometimes we don't think about uh, Jews and Christians really being all that educated. In fact, there's an instance in Acts chapter 4 where a bunch of Jewish kind of elites, muckety-mucks, they look at the disciples of Jesus and they go, these are just ordinary, unschooled or uneducated people. But it's really not true. I want to show you how the Jewish people educated their children throughout about 4,000 years of Old Testament history. This is how it went down. So first, uh, children would start at the age of five studying the Torah. But before that, when a child was two or three, can you imagine this going down, by the way, in our children's ministry down there? Here's what would happen. When they're about two or three, the teacher would take the scroll that the word of God was written on, and they would put honey on the scroll around the edges, and they would walk around the room to these little ones. Can you just see that? And these children would reach out their tongues and lick the honey from the scroll, and the teacher would say, remember, children, the word of God is sweet. Eat it, taste it, savor it. 
So at a very early age, they learned the word of God. It was not a big, scary, fat book that only super smart people could understand, but that it was sweet and it was honey and nourishing to their souls too. By the age of five, they would study the Torah. And since we're not a room full of Jews, I'll just explain. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. By age six, they had memorized the entire book of Leviticus. Now, I'm sure that you guys have your devotional time every morning in the book of Leviticus. But for those of you who haven't bumped your head on that book in a while, it's incredibly boring. But by the age of six, they had memorized the whole book of Leviticus. By age 10, they were studying the Mishnah, which is a Jewish book that is just a commentary on the Torah. It just explains to them how to interpret it. What does it mean? You got six-year-olds reading scriptural commentaries. Then by, I'm sorry, by the age of 10, by the age of 12, they have memorized the entire Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Then at the age of 12, they take an exam. It's an oral exam, which doesn't mean that they're examining them for cavities. Um, They are asking them questions, and I thought that was way funnier than it turned out to be. I'm looking to Andy for sympathy. Yeah, you've been there. Uh, So they would do this oral exam, And if they pass that exam, then the boys would become bar mitzvah, which just means a man of the commandments. And the women would become bat mitzvah, a woman of the commandments or of the law. And at that point, they're considered a grown-up. Now, at that point, the women would marry, and the men would go into a trade, into the family business, or they would go into what's called the bet Talmud, the house of learning. Now, about a 1,000 would go into the trade for every one that went into the house of learning, which is what we would call maybe Bible college or seminary, except theirs lasted a lot longer, 18 years of school. I mean, you were studying to be a rabbi longer than you study to be a doctor today, right? That's crazy. Huge emphasis on education. Now, the top student, so and then when they, if they re- reached the end of those 18 years, then they would graduate. And for their graduation ceremony, they were baptized. Because baptism was a sign that you had just changed social classes. You moved up from being just a normal person to now being a leader. You're a rabbi. Just as if you went from unclean to clean, for instance. So it was just a symbol of, hey, a big change has just happened in your life. They would graduate. Now, most of those... Uh, most of those graduates from the House of Learning would become rabbis. And the rabbi's job is to take the yoke, you heard that word in the Bible? Take the yoke, which is the teaching or the interpretation of their rabbi, and pass it on to more students. Your job was just to take the yoke exactly as it was given to you and pass it on to other people verbatim. But a very few, so about a thousand would go do that, about one would go and become a rabbi with authority. We see that throughout scripture, and a rabbi without authority is someone who can now have their own teaching, a unique teaching, a unique interpretation, a new way that you haven't heard before. And they go and they teach that to their disciples. Jesus is often called a rabbi with authority. Whenever he says something they had never heard before, like love your enemies, that had never been taught, then they would say he speaks as if one with authority. He had authority. Now, all of this was a system of education that throughout the Old Testament for almost 4,000 years that boys and girls, men and women could participate in. Now, it's hard to participate when you get married at 12 and 13, so very few women made it past that age. But at least to the age of 12, girls and boys got the same education. And it's a lot of education, isn't it? But by the time of Jesus, that had changed. That had completely changed. Now what happened? I want to show you this. I didn't do this in the last service, but I think it will help for the visual learners among us. If you have your Bible, you can go to page 654. That's the last page of the Old Testament. All right? Last page of the Old Testament is the book of Malachi. Everything on this side right here, this is all what we call Old Testament. All right? Old Testament. And everything on this side is New Testament. All right? So right here in this space right there, you can just imagine This right here is 400 years. There's 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So they were doing things this way, educating their sons and daughters all throughout this. Then when we get here in the New Testament, daughters aren't being educated anymore. What happened in the 400 years? What happened was that the Jewish people 
were, were dominated, they were owned by the Syrians and the Phoenicians and the Greeks and the Romans. And the way that their politicians talked was the way that the Jewish people began to believe. And the way that their philosophers taught was the way the Jewish people began to believe so that the Jewish faith became more a reflection of the culture, more a reflection of their oppressors than it was a reflection of God's will all along. And so we know that in that period of time, that 400 years, for instance, there was a philosopher, a Greek philosopher named Thales of Miletus. And he said this, that every day he thanked fortune, that was his God, he thanked the fortune first that I was born a human being and not one of the brutes. Next, that I was born a man and not a woman. Thirdly, that I was born a Greek and not a barbarian. Now that happened in the middle of that 400 years. But by the time we get to Jesus, that is normal Jewish thinking. And we know that Jews at the time of Jesus, Jewish men were praying three things every morning when they got out of bed. They would thank God, they would say this, blessed are you God, our Lord, King of the universe, who has made me a Jew and not a Gentile. Blessed are you God, our Lord, King of the universe, who has made me a man and not a woman. Blessed are you, God, our Lord, King of the universe, who has made me free and not a slave. That is Greek. That is not godly. And so women, by the time of Jesus, were not trustworthy witnesses in the court. They were not allowed to have education. It was said that it would be better to burn the word of God than entrust it to a woman. And if you have a daughter, you have been cursed she is nothing but a liability and a source of shame for you. Imagine being a woman in the day of Jesus. One of the teachers, Jewish teachers at the time of Jesus, a Jewish sage named Ben Sirach said this, do not even sit down with a woman. Just as moths come out of clothes, spite comes out of a woman. And then he said this, this is really cute. You might want to get this cross-stitched on a pillow, maybe give it to, your, give it to a woman that you love for Mother's Day. Um, a man's spite is preferable to a woman's kindness. Women give rise to shame and reproach. So by the time of Jesus, you couldn't sit down with a woman, but there's Jesus sitting with a woman. You couldn't touch a woman who wasn't your bride, but there's Jesus healing females, touching them. You couldn't speak to a woman who wasn't a relative, but there's Jesus calling their name. You couldn't teach a woman. You'd be better to just burn the word of God. But there is Jesus opening the Torah to women. That should have been ordinary, but it was, in fact, extraordinary. Now, when I first learned this, I was honestly shocked. It was scandalous to me because, look, I, I'll just be honest and confess. Look, I thought there were only 12 disciples and that they were all dudes, so this really rocked my world, and I, I very much resisted it. I did not want to hear it. I, I called the people who were teaching me this total liberals and all kinds of worse things under my breath. And then I looked at Scripture. In Matthew 27, we meet a man named Joseph of Arimathea. All the Bible tells us about him is that he was rich, and he was a disciple of Jesus, but he wasn't one of the 12. In Luke 19, uh, we see Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey as kings would have done in those days. And it says that a whole crowd of disciples, folks, that's more than 12. A whole crowd of disciples were shouting, Hosanna, praise to God. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Okay, so I had to admit at that point, okay, there were more than 12, but they were probably all dudes. But then I read Luke 10. Luke 10. Luke 10's a familiar story that we kind of misunderstand. Jesus is traveling with his disciples and they come to the house of a woman named Martha. Martha has a sister named Mary, a different Mary. There are seven Marys in the Bible just to make it very confusing. This is Mary of Bethany, not Mary the Magdalene. And Mary, it says, sits at the feet of Jesus listening to what he said. And Martha's in the kitchen, and she's doing what was, at that time, women's work. She's making the hors d'oeuvres. She's pouring the sweet tea. She's getting it all ready, and Martha gets very upset. And so modern American preachers will often, I mean, they usually say, well, Martha's very type A, and she has a hard time relaxing. And, and Mary, though, is, is more leisurely, and she can rest. And so Jesus is saying, hey, it's really good that Mary is taking a break and resting. That's good. 
But the words are very clear here that Martha is nervous. She's concerned. She's not mad that she's doing all the work. She's very worried about something. What she's worried about is that Mary is in man territory doing male things. And that's scandalous. And if anybody finds out, we could get kicked out of our synagogue. Jesus, stop her from sitting down at your feet and learning from you like a disciple. In fact, this phrase, sitting at the feet, is a common idiom of the day. It's used again in Acts 22.3, where the apostle Paul is describing what a good and faithful Jew he is. And he says, I studied under Gamaliel, which is a rabbi, and I was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. But if you look in the English translation, it will say, I studied under. But if you look in the original language, it says, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Same exact words used for what Mary did at the feet of Jesus. She sat down at the feet of her rabbi. She chose him to be her teacher, and she wanted to be his student. And Jesus said to the worried Martha, who thought, this is scandalous. What are people going to say? He said to her, she's chosen a better thing. She's chosen a very good thing, and I'm not going to take this from her. It should have been ordinary that girls and women could learn, could develop their faith. But unfortunately, at that time, it was extraordinary. All ordinary Christians, all ordinary Christians, no matter their level of education, no matter their gender, no matter their age, all ordinary Christians are disciples, students of Jesus. But discipleship is still an extraordinary thing. It's a thing that not enough of us do. Now, the Bible does very clearly in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, it really does make clear a major difference between the male disciples of Jesus and the female disciples of Jesus. It's very obvious that they're making clear there is a big difference between a male disciple of Jesus and a female disciple of Jesus. And the difference is that when things got hard, the male disciples fled and the female disciples followed. They were actually better at this. You see, a disciple isn't just a student, but a follower. You were thought to learn the most from your rabbi by following them in their everyday life, not just sitting and listening to them lecture. And Mary was a superior disciple. She followed Jesus all the way to the cross. The men ran away scared, but there's Mary. And many women watching their teacher be brutalized on the cross. And these women didn't stop there, but they waited until the body was taken down and it was given to Joseph of Arimathea, also a disciple. And they followed him and they watched as he laid laid the body of their teacher, their rabbi Jesus, in the tomb. They followed all the way. Even on the Sunday morning, when the women were the ones who stuck around and they went to the tomb and they discovered that the stone had been rolled away and it was empty and there were just his clothes laying there. And they're so confused about what had happened. They hear someone walk up behind them, Mary the Magdalene, who seems to be the leader of these women. She hears and she thinks it's a gardener. She doesn't recognize the voice coming from behind her. And so she says, if you took his body, if you know what happened to him, look, just just tell me. We'll go. We'll get him. We'll find him and we'll bring him. Imagine Mary and her sisters thinking they're going to carry a full-grown man, but they are passionate about this. We want our Jesus back. And that's when the gardener speaks and it's Jesus. And he said, Mary. Now, in this culture, just imagine how extraordinary that is. That the first word that the resurrected Jesus says is a woman's name, Mary. And she recognizes it at once. And it says that she turns toward him 
And she cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher, master. And Jesus said, don't hold on to me. I haven't ascended yet to the Father. Go to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary the Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he was the one who had said these things to her. Luke's gospel says that none of the disciples believed her, an unreliable witness, a female, but Jesus staked the good news on a woman. The very first person to sell the good news that Jesus had conquered death was a woman. We have a word for someone who sees the resurrected Jesus and is sent by the resurrected Jesus to tell others he is alive, and that word is apostle. Mary the Magdalene is the first apostle. Not only that, but the earliest Christians gave her the high title, apostle to the apostles. She was the first to declare the world, he is risen, sent by Jesus himself. She is not the only female apostle. In Romans chapter 16, the apostle Paul is giving a letter to Christians there in Rome, and he ends the letter by making sure he thanks some very important people in the church in Rome. And he says, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles. One of the earliest Christian pastors, a man named John Chrysostom, preached a passage just, he preached an entire sermon just on Junia being an apostle, sent by God with the good news. And here's what he said. To be an apostle is something great. But to be outstanding among the apostles, just think what a wonderful song of praise that is. Indeed, how great the wisdom of this woman must have been that she was even deemed worthy of the title of apostle. Jesus' disciples, after he ascended to heaven, they all gathered together in a room and the Holy Spirit came down. It's a strange phenomenon. And they all began to preach the good news to people who would hear it. And it was, uh, they were speaking in languages that they didn't think that they knew and it was just a very bizarre thing. And so Peter decided to explain to people who were watching what was going on. And so he said this, and he's quoting the Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all my people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. In 1 Corinthians 12, the apostle Paul defines what prophecy is. It's not being able to tell the future, but it's being able to tell the truth in a way that encourages and educates and edifies the church. And Peter's saying, this day was promised to you that when the Messiah comes, that God's going to make a family that's male and female. And his spirit, his power will be in both. And they are both going to be sent into the world to speak on behalf of God. You knew this day would come. And so at a time in history, when Jewish men were praying, thank you, God, that I'm a man and not a woman. Thank you that I am free and not a slave. Thank you that I am a Jew and not a Gentile. The Apostle Paul says this about the family of God, the church. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ extraordinary ordinary christians are sent every single one of us are sent into the world by the risen christ to tell the world he is risen but so few of us go going is an extraordinary thing every single christian here this morning every single one of us we were saved and set free. How extraordinary that is. Every single one of us, whether we have wealth that's financial or time or talent, we have all been made wealthy and we have the opportunity to be generous 
And every single one of us, every ordinary Christian here this morning, every single one of us should be a student, a disciple of Jesus, better learning and understanding our faith and being changed by it. And lastly, every single one of us has been sent by Jesus into all the world. For me, that might be talking about faith of my next door neighbor while he power washes his driveway. (laughs) Or yesterday, I talked to Jesus with the woman who trimmed up my hair a little bit for me. Maybe for you, it means actually going to another part of the world. But every single one of us are sent. There's nothing extraordinary or special about it. This is ordinary Christianity. Let me pray. God, we thank you. Thank you, God, for saving us, for making us generous, for sending every one of us and making us students of your word and of our faith. God, we pray that you would be powerful in us and through us. You would take us just ordinary people and you do extraordinary things with us. We love you, God, and we thank you for your word for how it changes us. It's in Jesus' name we pray.